गुड मॉर्निंग वी आर नाउ स्टार्टिंग लेक्चर सेवनटीन दिस इज आर फर्स्ट सेशन ऑन मॉड्यूल थ्री बेसिक मेट्रिक्स मेथड्स वी हैव कंप्लीटेड द रिव्यू ऑफ बेसिक स्ट्रक्चर एनालिसिस वी टुक सिक्सटीन आवर्स सिक्सटीन लेक्चर्स टू फिनिश इट एंड द रीजन वाई वी स्पेंड सो मच टाइम इज यू रियली कान डू एनीथिंग एडवांस्ड अंडर यूर स्ट्रॉन्ग इन द बेसिक्स एंड दैट्स कंटिन्यूइंग प्रॉब्लम वी फेस विद structural engineers and i think it's a very good idea to always go back to the basics and strengthen them so this is module 3 basic matrix concepts we will first cover simple mathematics principles of linear algebra which you probably already studied so it's a quick review and then we'll get into how you can apply concepts of matrices to do structural analysis uh the book we will be following is the book i have written called advanced structural analysis published by narosa in india and alpha science international uh, it's a hard bound edition uh, abroad the topics covered in this course will be after the review of basic structural concepts will be matrix concepts and methods then we look at how to apply these concepts to structures with axial elements like trusses next how to apply them to beams and grids next plane and space frames and finally in the seventh module we will be covering uh, a bit of non linear analysis uh, as applied to elastic instability and second order analysis in this particular uh, session where we cover the mathematics uh, underlying matrix concepts we'll review what we mean by a matrix a vector the elementary matrix operations including matrix multiplication and transposition we we'll look at what it means to know the rank of a matrix and how it is useful in solving linear simultaneous equations which is what we need to do in structural analysis and uh, how it can be done using matrix inversion and finally we look at eigen values and eigen vectors because they have a role to play especially when you do elastic instability analysis and later in dynamics but before we do all that we should see the role that matrices play in structural analysis why do we need to study this topic which you had studied in mathematics how does it have a role in structural analysis could, could someone give an answer to that question for structural analysis is all about finding the response the force response and displacement response of a given structure when it is subject to a given set of loads the loads could be direct loads direct actions or indirect loads including support movements uh, environmental changes and uh, construction errors so where do matrices come here we can uh, build up matrices for uh, one load to the other uh, <coughs> points at the location and we can build a matrix for different position different forces what would be the rea rea reaction for these forces okay. so now we are actually stepping back from calculation and trying to look at the big picture uh because if you want a digital computer to do structural analysis you have to see the big picture and you realize that basically you're dealing with numbers if you want to find unknown forces internal forces bending moments shear forces actual forces at different locations you're actually dealing with numbers which can be put nicely in arrays okay so you're dealing with vectors and you're dealing with properties of the structure like the stiffness matrix and the flexibility matrix so that's how you can deal with it in a matrix configuration for example from the input side you definitely have the load vector which are loads that are applied at different joint locations you may have known support displacement so you have a support displacement vector you may have some initial deformations or temperature changes 
and what you need to find is the displacement at, at all the degrees of freedom that you have identified, the active coordinates, you need to find the support reactions, you need to find the internal forces, you may also want to find the uh, member deformations like the elongations in truss members. In short, all the variables, all the quantities that you need to find in the force field and the displacement field can be expressed in a numerical manner, but you need to con conveniently do it and you need to do it in a systematic way and if you want a computer to do it, uh, you also need to first model the structure itself which is uh, not that easy. That means you and I can see a truss and visualize it, but how does a computer do it? Well, the computer does not think. So, uh, you should be able to even define the geometry of the structure using <coughs> coordinates, you know Cartesian coordinates and to, you need to also check whether what the computer interprets is the structure that you have. Please note you are dealing with a mathematical model of an idealized structure and uh, in modern software, software packages you have a, a, a tool, a visual ability where you get back the picture of the structure that you input and if you find some members are out of place or oriented the wrong way you can make corrections. So, uh, you can use visual basic for example, to do such things that is a separate field. So, basically you have some unknown quantities and some known quantities in the displacement field and the force field and you need to know certain laws which are hidden in the structure which enable transformations to take place. So, basically we want to transform the loads to the responses and this becomes easy relatively easy when you are dealing with a linear analysis because it is a linear transformation. You are actually converting one vector to another vector with the help of a matrix. For example, uh, one of those sets of relationships are as I have shown there relating forces the force field to the displacement field with the help of the stiffness matrix which you can partition and uh, you have a large number of analysis software packages available today and unfortunately today we are in a stage where uh, structural engineers are no longer doing any manual analysis and they are learning how to use the design or the analysis manual that comes along with the package and you input some numbers and you get some output, but if you really do not know what is going on it is garbage in and garbage out. In fact, uh, if you read the preface to this book on advanced structural analysis, I have raised some of these concerns. Uh, in the olden days when there were no computers, there was no choice you had to understand structural behavior. Uh, you had to know what is you have to know whether the bending moment that you calculated makes sense or not. You have to know whether it should be sagging or hogging, but now you do not know because you are getting some number thrown up by the computer and this the need to do analysis faster and quicker is so strong now that there is no time to pause and reflect and that old breed of structural engineers who really understood what was going on is a vanishing species. Uh, so, it is important to always step back to have some rough checks which is where you need to have a good foundation of basic structural analysis. So, here is the first sentence in the preface, there is an increasing tendency among modern structural engineers to lean heavily on software packages for everything. Okay. In fact, uh, even design is done without thinking, you have computer aided design. In, uh, at the press of a button you get big reports which the client receives and thinks you have done a phenomenal job of, but actually all you did was to press a button. And in fact today we have reached a stage where quantity surveying, planning everything is programmed. The only thing the computer has not yet been able to do is actually construct buildings at the press of a button, but maybe that may also happen and hopefully the building will stand. Uh, so, this induces a false sense of knowledge, security and power. 
The computer is indeed a powerful tool and an asset for any structural engineer, but it is in dangerous to make the tool one's master and to make it a convenient substitute for human knowledge, experience and creative thinking. So I hope you appreciate this. I hope you enjoyed what we did in basic structural analysis, but you must not lose that touch and always go back to it and have simple ways of checking your answers. So that is where matrices come in. So let us quickly cover the mathematical concepts. What is a matrix? Now you should think general because matrix concepts can be applied to a wide variety of not just engineering issues, but even issues in biology, in social sciences, economics and so on. So what is a matrix? Set of things. There are no things. No, the computer does not see things. Set of numbers. Right. By definition, a matrix is a rectangular array of elements arranged in horizontal rows and vertical columns. So it should look neat. Okay. It should look neat and every number has a place. Uh, a i j, ith row, jth column. So it is a rectangular array. So I wish you had said rectangular, you did not say it. It is not a circular array, it is a rectangular array. Uh, the entries of a matrix are called elements. They are scalar quantities, they are not things, they are commonly numbers, but they can also be functions, they can be operators, they can also be matrices which are called sub matrices uh, and they could be algebraic functions, but they should make sense. So you have mathematics and you have physics and our job is to link the physics to the mathematics. Every number has a place and a meaning. So typically there are many ways you can write or designate a matrix. In textbooks you will find usually with a bold capital letter. Okay, so A is shown bold, but when you do it on paper, uh, you can't make it bold unless you have the bold ballpoint pens. Uh, so you have to, what we normally do is we put braces outside it box brackets commonly as shown here and uh, there are alternative ways you can do it, but actually that one letter stands for, can stand for a huge set of numbers, variables which can occupy uh, numerical values as shown here. Now what is m into n? m rows and n columns, that is called the order of the matrix. So you know very well, it is called the order of the matrix. So let us see, when m is equal to n, what do you call that type of matrix? Square matrix, very good. When all the elements are 0, huh? null matrix, and it has a symbol capital O. Okay. When the off diagonal elements are 0 and all the diagonal elements are unity, it is an identity matrix, very good. Now these are, so we can go fast because you seem to know everything, but at least you know the, you should know the notations used. For example, a 3 by 3 identity matrix looks like that. What are these elements called? Uh, you have two diagonals in that matrix, you have diagonal the other way, but the, there is a principal diagonal. Okay. And uh, a matrix which has non-zero elements only in the diagonal is called a diagonal matrix. Very good. Is this a diagonal matrix? No. So how would you? What are the different adjectives you can give for this matrix? Huh? Symmetric. By the way, a stiffness matrix looks like this. Typically, a stiffness matrix looks like this. That's why I chose. Uh, so it's symmetric. Very good. What else? It's square, very good. Can a non-square matrix be symmetric? No. So a symmetric uh, necessarily uh, includes, is it an upper triangle? No, no. All the diagonal elements are positive, that is true. But what is the name of the matrix? I am not asking you to describe the contents of the matrix. Uh, this can be any matrix. Uh, in structural engineering, it could be a stiffness matrix. 
it is a banded matrix because why is it a banded matrix because it you have only the diagonal elements and you have elements next to the diagonal so it forms a band that is good it is a banded matrix and uh, many of the elements are 0 there is an there is an advantage in terms of storing the matrix if many are 0 why you can store only the banded portion okay so storage is easier that is called a sparse matrix so square matrix symmetric matrix banded matrix sparse sparse means not not filled empty this class is relatively full but on the days before you have other exams you have a sparse uh, matrix here because uh, some of you do not show up right so now it is not sparse uh, what are these matrices called very good lower triangle typically shown with capital L and upper triangle shown with U and you are familiar with partitioning of matrices when do you need to partition matrices when you uh, want to make life simpler when you deal with a complex system you want to operate with subsystems you do not want to look at the big big picture all the time but so you pick out little pieces from your big picture but you should know where it is how it is positioned and so on but always so you can draw these partition lines and subdivide and your you have different sub matrices will have different orders but they should all add up to the order of the full matrix quickly you you seem to know everything about matrices what about a vector is it a type of matrix Yes, sir, it is a matrix. Which is bigger, matrix or vector? Matrix. Which is more general? Matrix. 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 Right. So, vector is one type of matrix. What is a vector? It's a column. Okay. It's a matrix which has only one column, right? A vector is a simple array of scalar quantities, typically arranged in a vertical column. Hence, the vector can be visualized as a matrix of order m into one and you use you do not use the word order anymore you use the word dimension okay m is the dimension and you you can say elements but the right word to use is components you have components in a vector and elements in a matrix you have dimension in a vector because the uh, one of the other order items is equal to unity and you have an order in a matrix okay so it is typically arranged like this and again you have a bold letter to dis describe the vector but here the brace we use just for convenience is a curly brace but if you put a square brace you are not really making a mistake because it is after all a type of a matrix but do not put a curly brace on a matrix of size m into n where n is not equal to 1 but you are allowed to put a square brace even for a vector when you have something like this some people call this also vector but it is actually the transpose of this that is a vector so this is sometimes referred to as a row vector but it is strictly not a vector now vectors are important you know we are dealing with displacement vectors and force vectors so they they have some meaning and it is good to see the background we can visualize a multi dimensional linear vector space R m whose dimension m is given by the minimum number of linearly independent vectors with real components required to span the space these are beautiful words there is a word called spanning there is a word called linearly independent vectors there is another word called basis what is basis span. Because we can span the sorry one at a time yeah. linearly independent vectors we can span the space okay what is the I why, why do you need to get a basis Okay. Uh, do you see it has a role not just in uh, physics but in other uh, fields of knowledge let us take uh, social sciences in fact it is more difficult there because if you really want to get a complete picture of, uh, of say human behavior uh, you need to be able to construct a, a, a framework where you have these linearly independent vectors and uh, 
it is very difficult, because you have to establish that they are independent and that provides a framework for you to describe behavior. So, uh, these are not just mathematical terms, they have wide applications and so vectors are set to span a vector space, if the space consists of all possible linear combinations of those vectors. So, you should be able to capture any vector in that space with the help of your uh, linearly independent vectors and any set of vectors that are linearly independent and also span the vector space is called a basis of the vector space. What is the simplest basis that we use in physics for example, i j k. So, in a three dimensional space you are familiar with this, you have i j k and you have unit vectors which form a good basis. So, you have 1 0 0, 0 1 0 and 0 0 1 and any vector in that space for example, 2 minus 1 3 you can write it in a in a column, but it actually has a sense of direction uh, v equal to 2 i minus j plus 3 k and it also has a length which is obtained by the resultant of the scalar quantities right. So, uh, you are familiar with it, it is also called the magnitude is it clear. So, vectors are uh, meaningful and a set of vectors v 1, v 2 to v n having the same dimension m is said to be linearly independent, if no linear combination of them other than the 0 combination results in a 0 vector. That is the proof whether you really landed up with linearly independent vectors, otherwise you have a problem, because there is a correlation between vectors. Elementary matrix operations, I will go very fast, you are familiar with it, you have scalar multiplication. The scalar is never shown in bold, so lambda is a scalar you have mat matrix addition and a plus b will be equal to b plus a that is a property. What is that property called? Commutative. Commutative property and if you put a negative sign. So, we only say addition, but addition is generic it includes subtraction because you are putting a multiplying with minus 1 which is a scalar. Matrix multiplication is when you studied it first time it looked very funny, because it did not lo look like the multiplication of scalars but now you are used to it. So, the you have a distributive property also a plus b plus c is the same as a plus b which is the matrix plus c ok. Now, a b equal to c you cannot just multiply any two matrices right, they you have to satisfy some requirements. What are those requirements? So, basically you know you know what to do, uh, you know what to do if you want to find c i j, you have to take the ith row of the a matrix and the jth column of the b matrix and you have to multiply each term with its corresponding term. So, you must they must match in terms of dimension. So, that is why uh, m into n order multiplied by n into p order will give you an m into p order right. So, you are familiar with this, but let us look at it more closely. You know how to do it, but let us see if we can make some physical sense out of it. I will give you a clue ok. You can do that multiplication in this manner. What does this manner suggest? Now, this is something you may not have studied when you did linear algebra what does this signify right. I can get the same answer by doing the multiplication in this way. What does this suggest? It suggests a certain principle. I took the first column, I took the first element of the first row, I took the second column, I took the second element of the first row and I get the first column in the resulting matrix. So, what does this principle show? Linear combination of very good every column vector of C is a linear combination of the column vectors of the pre multiplying matrix A ok. Uh, incidentally in terms of direction if you multiply a vector with a scalar you are getting the same direction you are only changing its length. You can do another operation in the other direction and you will prove that every row vector of C is a linear combination of the row vectors of the 
post multiplying matrix B. That is just a physical meaning to, to so the, the moral of the story is you can blindly do matrix operation, but you can also do them with your eyes open and figure out everything makes sense, you are playing with vectors and you have these properties A, B, what are these properties, you are familiar with all of them, associative and distributive and then if you multiply with a null vector you get anything multiplied with 0 is 0 and uh, you get identity only uh, repli replicates. The commutative property is not there, you are familiar with it, A, B is not equal to B A, you may not even be able to do the multiplication sometimes. Okay. Transpose, you are familiar with that, Transpose, transposition is an operation in which a rectangular array of the matrix is rearranged or transposed such that the order of the matrix changes from M into N to N into M with the rows change into columns preserving the order. So, if, if the original matrix A is A i j, then the transpose will be A i j transpose which is A j i and the order changes from M into N to N into M, you are familiar with this and you have these properties. The, the, if you take the transpose of the transpose, you get back the original matrix. If you multi, pre multiply it with the, with the scalar, you can take it outside and this is interesting. The third one is also simple A plus B the whole transpose is A transpose plus B transpose, but A B the whole transpose is B transpose A transpose. So, here you have to do a switch then only it works. Uh, supposing B and A are the same, okay, then what is the kind of matrix that you get? If you multiply a matrix pre multiply a matrix with its own transpose, what is the type of matrix you will get? You will get a square matrix plus? Symmetric. It will be symmetric, it will be symmetric. Uh, how do you know it is symmetric? You take the transpose of this matrix and you will get back the original matrix. So, that is very interesting okay. and uh, you can demonstrate it with examples, we would not uh, uh, spend time. Sometimes you see matrices where the transpose gives you a negative sign, okay. So, uh, this is called a skew symmetric matrix, right. So, now next we will talk about uh, the products of two vectors. You cannot multiply two vectors, you know that, why? Because they both have this, you have to take the transpose of one of them. You commonly meet this situation when you want to find work. Take in structural analysis, you have the force vector, you have the displacement vector, you cannot multiply f into d, either you take the transpose of f and multiply it with d or you take the transpose of d and multiply it with f, is it clear? Then you will end up with 1 by 1 quantity, what is that? That is a scalar, that is a scalar. So, the product, what kind of product is this? Well, we say dot product in physics, when you deal with 2 and 3 dimensional spaces but it is called an inner product in general, it is called an inner product and you can also show it in this fashion, this is a symbolic way of showing the inner product. So, I will read this, the, the product f transpose d equal to lambda results in a matrix of order 1 into 1 which is nothing but a scalar, such a product which is sometimes denoted as f comma d with those triangular braces is called inner product or dot product in vector algebra involving two and three dimensional vectors. This product essentially reflects the projected length of one vector along the direction of the other vector. We are familiar with this in physics. The magnitude of any vector v can also be viewed as an inner product of v with itself, you are familiar with that. Vectors are said to be orthonormal when if you do their inner product you either get 0 or 1, okay. What is this uh, symbol called? This delta is called the Kronecker delta, okay. The commutative product of the inner, uh, the commutative property of the inner product is what I explained a while back. You can calculate work either by taking, by converting the force 
vector to a row vector or the displacement vector to a row vector you get the same answer and if you introduce the, the relationship between force and displacement through the stiffness matrix you can arrive at an interesting conclusion can you tell me what that conclusion is see the first is the commutative property the second is a stiffness relationship it is a law if you plug in the second property to the first property what can you end up proving case yes that is that is really good. So, you take the inner product in this manner you get lambda now you substitute substitute uh, you take the transpose of this you still get lambda then when you compare these two expressions d transpose k d is the same in both but in one you have k transpose so you end up proving k is equal to k transpose so it is a very elegant mathematical proof uh, requirement of why the stiffness matrix must be symmetric okay we'll study symmetry from the structural analysis point of view later now let's get to the the real need for bringing in matrices we need to solve equations right and we want the computer to do it we don't want to do it ourselves because it's a pain sometimes so linear simultaneous equations can be written as ax plus ax equal to c a is called the coefficient matrix as we saw in this case of the stiffness matrix it's a property of the structure x is a vector like the displacement vector and c could be a load vector c is some set of constants right if c is 0 well you should not say 0 you should say o because 0 is a scalar o is a vector or a matrix then those set of equations are called homogeneous equations you are familiar with them when do you need to look at the solution for homogeneous equations in solving linear simultaneous equations even if you have a non-zero c a constant vector you may still need to inspect this solution that is called the null space of A all possible solutions when do you need to do this so it is very interesting though we do not directly need it in structural analysis you need to do it because uh, well it is related to what is called the rank of the matrix what is the rank of the matrix A it is a beautiful concept independent number of independent uh, we can find out number of independent okay you uh, kind of vaguely know what it means so let us explore it okay rank of a matrix the rank of the matrix a is equal to the number of linearly independent column vectors of the matrix and this number is identical to the number of linearly independent row vectors so the maximum value of the rank r of any matrix of order m into n is given by either m or n whichever is lower and the minimum value is 1 okay let us look more closely at this the subspace in the vector space rm containing all linear combinations of the independent column or row vectors is called the column space or row space of a and this subspace has a dimension equal to the rank r so you you have to finally get to the number of linearly independent vectors take a look at this uh, matrix it is a 4 by 3 matrix obviously the rank cannot exceed 3 so is the rank 1 2 or 3 2 why do you say 2 third one and second one that is good that is quick uh, smart looking but in general it is good to keep quiet and do an analysis before you pop out with the answer 3 you should never say because you cannot spot it so easily sometimes it is cleverly disguised you cannot catch it right so how do you capture the rank of a matrix so there is a beautiful technique you have studied this your MATLAB will do this easily it is called the row reduced echelon form relatively easy way of determining the rank of a matrix is by reducing the matrix to its form R through a process of elimination you are familiar with this huh? yes or no no sir. No, sir. Yes, sir. Some part now, of yes, sir. you need no, not no. assert yes. You should have the care and concern for other members of your group. This is a matrix, right? Don't be the dominant diagonal. 
you should care for those who, who are saying they do not have an exposure. You cannot insist they have an exposure, right? All you can insist is I know, and that too we will check shortly whether how well you know it. <laughs> it is always good to say I do not know, I want to learn or I want to relearn. Okay. So, the idea is so it is a refresher for many of you. Uh, incidentally, we are just covering the theory, I would say more for fun because nobody is going to do it at this stage in your life. Uh, you are going to use press buttons and, and let the computer do it, but there is a nice story it is telling and I think it is worth understanding this. So, how do we do that? Any matrix R you can finally through doing elimination. Many of you, those who said no, uh, you are familiar with Gauss elimination. So, you basically play around with rows, you multiply and add different rows, you are allowed to do that, right but you have to do it all the way including the column vector right and so you can play with them and that's allowed and you don't lose uh, anything in doing so you can multiply a row with 2 and subtract 3 from the next row and so on those are row operation that you can do but the idea is you do them so that you can get an identity matrix in the left hand uppermost corner so you get an i matrix there and the idea is to get 0 below. So, you can always reduce R to this form where you have null matrices at the bottom, identity matrix at the top left corner and you will get some matrix F. What is F called? It has a name. Those who said you know everything, please answer. <laughs> F is called the free variable coefficient matrix. Why is it called that? Let us see. It is very interesting. Take a look at this matrix. Okay, let's do it step by step. What's the first thing you should do? Yeah, make make what one? Top left. Okay, left that left variable. Left. So that's called the pivot. Okay, so you divide that row with two, and then do a operation and get zeros in the other ones. This can be done. Okay, we'll just go through it fast. You've done it before in Gauss elimination. You would have done this. Okay, next that is our pivot, you will get that. Next, you got a lot of zeros already, the top one also should be 0. This is this uh, ultimate, you got the identity matrix. Okay. Actually, the last step is optional when you do simultaneously because you can do back substitution and get it. Okay, you have got this, then you look at the partitions, you have captured that I F O O beautifully. What is the rank of this matrix? It is the same matrix we looked at earlier. Rank is clearly 2, it is the size of your identity matrix, so it is R into R, that is clear, right. Now, this is how you can do it. In fact, you can write a program and it can do it on its own. Rank is 2, and let us look at a set of equations like this. Can this set of equations have a solution? Yes or no? Infinite number of solutions. Infinite number of solutions. Infinite solutions. Will they always have infinite solutions? Yes. 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 It may not have. Uh -huh. It may not have because first the constant vector must satisfy conditions of consistency. This is a so it is very interesting, but we do not need too much of it. So, I want you to read on your own. I will just rush through it. You will find, let us look at this. Finally, you have to solve equations like this. Do you agree to this? Those, if you take out those two rows, they should look like this, right? That is D0 should be O, and this must be satisfied by C for a feasible solution set. If it is not satisfied, you cannot solve this equation. And still you might get infinite solution, that is a different matter. But you cannot touch this if you have a violation of consistency. And whenever you have a problem like this, when you have free variables, you have to look at the, the, the infinite solutions come from the null space. So, you get one particular solution, you must have done this in differential equation. You get one particular solution, then you have to add the 
null space solution from the homogeneous equation. Okay. Let us take a look at this. You have x1, x2, x3, and you have this situation. Uh, if you take the rho reduce echelon form, it looks like that. Well, the last two rows, the constants should be 0. If you run the operations right through, they will look like that. So, you cannot do this for any arbitrary c. You agree? Yes. So, first that has to be satisfied, then only you can talk of a solution. And then also you may not get a unique solution because the rank is only 2, it is not 3. So, first you have to satisfy this, that means you can express C3 and C4 in terms of C1 and C2. So, let us look at a problem like that. Let us say C1 is A, C2 is B, then C3 and C4 must necessarily satisfy this requirement. Then you can talk of a solution, but even then you will not get a unique solution because the rank is not full. So, let us take an example like this and you do the rho reduced echelon form, you will get something like that. How do you solve this problem? Well, partition it, you can throw away the third and fourth rows because they already satisfy consistency, they are not going to help you. You have only two rows, but you have a problem there. So, you take the first set of equations, you can write x1 and x2 in terms of x3 clearly you don't have a unique solution right so you take a particular solution you can choose any value of x3 including minus 342.625 who cares any particular solution okay for convenience we took x3 equal to 3 then you got a unique solution for x1 and x2 right but this is not a complete solution you have to take the null space solution the easiest null space solution, let us take some scalar like lambda, let x3 be lambda, plug them into those equations and you will find that if x3 is plus lambda, x1 and x2 must turn out to be minus lambda minus lambda. So, what is your complete solution? Right? That is how, this is how you give the complete it is for you to learn for your general knowledge. We do not have fortunately such problems except when your structure is unstable in which case you better worry about the structure falling down rather than solving these equations. You have to make the structure stable. Now, the other case we have is when r is equal to n, n is the number of columns which is less than the number of rows. Okay. So, coefficient matrix A has a full column rank but there are linearly independent rows, which also implies that the number of rows exceeds the number of columns. When do you have such a situation? When you have more equations than unknowns and then you need to satisfy consistency. Again, this comes in unstable structures, so we will just rush through this. You do not need it really. So, now it takes this form. There are no free variables here and the constant still must satisfy because it belongs to the same type you run this exercise, uh, let us just rush through this, once you have satisfied it, you get a unique solution. Okay. You do not need to have the null space here, this is the second type, we are not dealing with it in structural analysis. What do we deal with in structural analysis? Case 3 and case 4, what is case 3? R equal to m less than n, when do you get such a situation? When do you get more unknowns? and less equations, statically indeterminate structures. So, coefficient matrix A has a full row rank, but there are linearly dependent columns, which also implies that the number of columns exceeds the number of rows. We have more unknowns than equations. It is a situation we encounter in statically indeterminate structures. So, now you have only i and f, those o's vanish. Okay, You have a full row rank. So, your rho reduce echelon form looks like that i and f. So, you see you have infinite solutions, but your you do not have to worry about consistency. You do not have to worry about consistency and so uh, the those equations are not there. So, since there are free variables present, you have infinite possibilities. So, let us take an example like this a x equal to c. You run this operation till you end up with the row reduced echelon form. 
they are consistent you do not have to check on consistency, but now you uh, well to preserve to make it look like an identity matrix sometimes you have to interchange rows you know that operation you have to interchange rows in this case you have to do that and uh, they look like this. And if your constants have numbers like 362, uh, after your elimination they look like 37 and minus 3.5. You solve this, find the particular solution, find the null space solution, and you get it's similar to the first type of problem except consistency is not there. Okay, we don't even do this. We do it. When did we do it? We wanted to find displacements in statically indeterminate structures after having analyzed it remember there we chose lambda to be 0. So, we did not waste time doing all this okay? because you need any statically admissible solutions to apply the principle of virtual work. This case is straightforward full rank if you are lucky, but if your structure is stable you are likely to get this situation and if it is statically determinate this is straightforward. In this case, a coefficient matrix A has a full column rank as well as full row rank, and this also implies that the matrix is a square matrix. Such a matrix is said to be invertible or non singular. And if you have a matrix like this, and all our stiffness matrices for stable uh, structures will look like this, then you do not have a problem. You also have a symmetric matrix in our case, you have a unique solution. And you can use the Gauss elimination method, or you can reduce your row or reduce echelon form, and you can get the answer, right? In earlier uh, days, we used to make students actually painfully do all this, you know. But today we don't do that. We say you use the computer. Certainly, you be familiar with uh, software like MATLAB, where you just press a button, enter, enter the uh, matrix, and how all of you are familiar with MATLAB? There are some free freeware called called Skylab and so on, but I think in, we have many versions of MATLAB and MATCAD. So it's very easy today to find the find the inverse of a matrix. What's the problem with uh, some matrices regarding finding inverses? So that's true. So, in structural analysis where do you see a problem, we will see that. So, matrix inversion, when the matrix A is square and of full rank an alternative approach to solving the equations is by operation of inversion x is equal to A inverse C, A into A inverse is A inverse A is identity matrix, you are familiar with these. Uh, a inverse inverse gives you back A and so on. The last property is very interesting, it is like what you got in transpose A B the whole inverse is B inverse A inverse and uh, some mathematician gave a beautiful physical feel to this, he gave an analogy, do you remember I think I mentioned this earlier. He said how do you put on shoes, you first put on socks that is A matrix then you put on the shoe, how do you reverse the process, you have to first remove the shoe then you remove your socks right. So, that is why A B inverse is B inverse A inverse very easy to remember very nice analogy. What is the determinant of a matrix why do you need to know it, yeah whether it is in. So, in general it can be proved that the inverse exists if a scalar property called the determinant of the square matrix denoted a with those vertical lines or det A or delta A is not equal to 0. For a diagonal matrix the determinant is given by the product of all the diagonal elements you know that that is an easy way to find out. So, I think you are familiar with uh, finding determinants, so we would not spend too much time on this. You know about cofactors, okay. you really do not need to do it in, in this course in matrix methods, but it is good to refresh these uh, concepts. You know about the adjoint method of finding the inverse, yes or no? Yes. Okay. You know about Kramer's rule? Yes. No. Okay. So, okay, those who said no and if you are interested please read 
good book <laughs> in uh, matrix algebra or just read the the second chapter in this book on advanced structure analysis it's good to browse through these and uh, we can spend hours discussing these different methods of uh, finding the inverse like the gauss jordan in elimination method cholesky you know these were these are very good for stiffness matrices but we will not do that okay so we will Cramer's rule you are familiar with, it is very easy to do when your order is up to 3, beyond 3 manually it is not worth it and we use elimination methods to do so. We will stop here, uh, we will discuss the or maybe we will finish this condition of a matrix, a matrix if it is ill conditioned, if it is ill conditioned uh, you are not sure about the accuracy of the inverse that you get. How do you know whether your inverse is right or not? You again multiply it with the original matrix, you should get the, you will not get, not necessarily, you will have lot of rounding off errors while you do your elimination and so unless your matrix is healthy, it is in good condition and there are tests to check the condition of your matrix, you cannot be sure of finding its inverse and therefore solving, you are not sure about the answers you get. Now fortunately for us, our stiffness matrices are all healthy matrices, they are all well conditioned, you know about the property of positive definiteness, okay, so you should read these, I will just finish this, a square matrix of order n is said to be positive definite, if for an, any arbitrary choice of n dimensional vector x, the product x transpose a x yields a scalar quantity that is positive, if it is negative it is ill conditioned, if it is 0 it is called semi definite. Okay and you can use eigenvalues to decide. Basically if your diagonal elements are heavy and they are positive, you got a well conditioned matrix. That is the thumb rule and stiffness matrix will be like that. Flexibility matrix, there is no guarantee. That is another reason why flexibility matrix is not preferred for, it is too flexible, you know, you can run into problems of finding the inverse. Thank you, let us stop.